So the last thing we've got to do is talk about how we can estimate our population variance and standard deviation. If we're going to estimate or use a common interval for population variance, which is going to be very similar uh, method-wise to doing any other confidence interval, the only difference is we're going to have a different critical value. We're going to have something based on a chi distribution, chi squared distribution, which is on your table. I'm going to show you how to use that today. Other than that, it's the same idea for a confidence interval. You just need to know how to use the table. Also for hypothesis testing, same idea, same seven steps. You just need to know how to use the table. So we're going to find that out right now. So right now we're going to be estimating population variance and with it, standard deviation. What was a symbol for population variance? Do you remember that? Sigma, sure, with what? Squared. Squared, great. So that's variance. So population variance, we're talking about sigma squared. Now I'm going to give you a definition how we look at the distribution of sigma of our variance is with something called a chi-squared distribution. Chi-squared, it's like you're making a big X. One of them's curvy and one of them's straight. That's a chi-squared. I know it's weird. It's kind of fun to draw, though. It's kind of nice. Oh, this looks cool. I like this. So anyway, I get to draw that a lot when I was in my fraternity. Actually, we just made an X because we were lazy. Uh, but that's a chi-squared, and here's how you find out a chi-squared test statistic or the marker for chi-squared according to your population variance. Here it is. You take n minus 1. What's n stand for, ladies and gentlemen? Sample size. Great. Or if you're talking about um, trials, number of trials. But in, in our case, sample size. Then you're going to take S squared. What's S? What's S squared then? Sample. Sample. S would be sample standard deviation. So what's S squared? <laughs> sample variance. Sure, with the S, that's sample variance. You okay with that? And then this right here, sigma squared, that's population variance. So we got a couple things going on. We've got N is still sample size. No big deal. That really hasn't changed all semester long. N is sample size. S is sample standard deviation, so S squared is sample variance. And sigma squared, well that's our population variance, that's what we defined it as. Notice how this compares your sample variance to your population variance. That's really all it does, and it's also based on your sample size. So larger samples have a different reading than smaller samples. That should make sense because the larger our samples, the more accurately we're going to depict our population variance uh, with our, our sample variance. So those things all work together. Every time we have a marker, it's typically based on sample size and comparing two things. With our means, it was mean, a sample mean minus population mean, right? We compared it to standard deviation and the sample size. Here, we're having just our, our variances and our sample size. A couple things about this. Uh, the distribution I'm about to show you, right here, the archive squared distribution, it looks similar, similar to a normal distribution. But I've got to warn you, this thing is not a normal distribution. It is kind of a bell-shaped curve, but it's not symmetrical. This thing starts at 0, 0, shoots up, and has a tail to the right. This is a chi-squared distribution. And that's how it looks. A couple things about it we notice right off the bat, it is not symmetrical. It's not like a normal distribution. So write these things down. Definitely is not symmetrical. Another interesting thing about it, it's not like a, it's not like a Z score. The, these aren't Z scores. These are, are chi squared scores, which means that there's no zero in the middle. The zero is actually off the right hand side. Why? Because standard deviation and variance can't be zero. You can't even get a negative out of that. So all of our distribution of chi, of our our variances are positive. That means we're not going to have a negative. These are all greater than zero. They're all non-negative. So values are non-negative.
I mean, look at the way the formula is. Look at the board here real quick. Look up here. Can that be negative? No. Can that be negative? No. Can that be negative? No. Really? You can have a negative sample size? I'm going to select negative eight people. Ha 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 ha. They're very depressed people, hence the reason why they're negative. No, we can't do that. That doesn't make sense. So positive times positive over positive is going to give you positive. You're never going to get a negative. These are not like Z scores. They're not like T scores. They will not be negative. Also, this is going to deal with our degrees of freedom. Uh, one thing you do need to know is that as degrees of freedom goes up, this has less and less of a tail. In other words, as your sample size up goes up, that means your degrees of freedom goes up, right? That means this is going to become more symmetrical. So as degrees of freedom goes up, this becomes more symmetrical. Does it ever get to symmetrical? No, but it becomes more symmetrical. As degrees of freedom goes up, the distribution becomes more symmetrical. Also, probably the biggest thing for you, this is the hard one to remember. Every other chart that you've dealt with has given you uh, critical values from the, and it deals with the area to the left, whatever that value is, right? Remember that? Z scores, area to the left. T scores, area to the, actually, area in the tails. Chi squared is always based on the area to the right. I know it's weird. But it's always based on the area to the right, whatever critical value you're finding. So please write that down. This is a big one for you. This is the biggest one. It's the, only, the, uh, the biggest difference besides not having a zero in here and not being symmetrical. It gives the critical values for the area to the right of them. Fortunately for us, the area is still 1 under, under that chart. That's OK. It's, that idea stays the same. But it gives the critical values for the area to the right. Now, would you like to learn how to find those critical values? I hope so, because that's what we're going to do anyway, so you may as well want to do it, right? This is the last time I'm going to ask you, would you like to find something out? Oh, how sad. <laughs> what if you said no, just want to go home? Like, oh, bummer, that sucks. <laughs> well, um, now our nice blue screen as this thing warms up. Here's what we're going to do. Let's suppose that we have a sample size of 12. We're dealing with a 95% confidence level. Remember those confidence levels we were talking about? Yes. So we're back to the idea of confidence intervals. I want to find the critical values based on a chi-square chi distribution. Here's how your table is going to look. It looks going to look like that. Right now, we're just focused on critical values. You're going to draw a chart like this, just like you normally would with a, a standard normal distribution, with, with any other uh, confidence intervals or, or hypothesis testing. That's, that's what we would do, right? Is draw a picture of that. Typically, with confidence intervals, we didn't have to do it, but, but here I want you to see what's going on. Firstly, can you tell me what my alpha is? Where are you getting the 0 .05? <clears throat> Good. We know alpha and confidence level is a, a, a complementary idea. So th those things have to be one minus the other. So one minus confidence level gives us our alpha. Our alpha is 0 .05. Here's the deal. If we're talking about a <coughs> confidence interval, what that means is that we have two values that are stating a left and a right bound for our level of confidence to which we are certain 
the actual population variance will fall in that range. Remember, we talked about those confidence intervals, how we have those two numbers, not just one number, right? So tell me something. If I have these two numbers here, how much area is here and how much area is there? How much? Well, why not 0 0.05 and 0 0.05? That would make an alpha of 0 0.10. Are you clear on that? So with confidence intervals, you do have that split. It's very, very much like a two-tailed test. Remember talking about two-tailed tests? Very much like that. So this is 0 0.025, that's alpha over 2. That should be familiar. We've done that stuff before. And this is alpha over 2, or 0 0.025. Which ratio do you feel OK with that so far? All right. Now, do you look this up in a z-score? Do you look this up in a t-score? No. It's neither of those things. You look this up in your chi-square distribution. I'll show you how to do that right now. So take that out. which we are speaking. It says the chi-squared distribution off to the, the top there. Over here we see our degrees of freedom. Are you still familiar on how to find degrees of freedom? Yes. Pretty easy based on your sample size, right? How do you find degrees of freedom from your sample size? Yeah, so in, the, in the, uh, the example I was just giving you, what is our degrees of freedom? 11. Good. 12 minus 1 gives us 11. So we're right, we're right here. It breaks it down nice, nice for you. Now here's what this says. Notice at the very top it says area to the to the left? Area right. to the right. Area to the right of your critical value. Now here's the issue. Because this table is not symmetrical and there's no negative values on it whatsoever, you with me? You can't just find one and make it negative. There are no negatives. You have to find two for every single case that you're doing. You have to find a left chi-square and a right chi-square. Are you seeing that? There's no negative. They're all positives. It's not symmetrical. If it was, I mean, that'd be nice. You could take a positive and a negative. There's, there's no negative to take. It's not a symmetrical chart. So what you're looking at is the area to the right of whatever critical value you want. Now, the table I had you draw, it had an area to the right. That area was 0 0.025. Look at your, your table that you drew down from what I, what I just wrote on the board, right? 0 0.025. So we're going to go over here to the area to the right, 0 0.025. Hey, it's on, the, it's on the chart, isn't it? We're going to follow that down to our degrees of freedom, 11. And you're going to get 11, OK, 0 0.025. That's the area to the right. I'm going to follow my degrees of freedom over to the area to the right. And I'm going to get 21.92. Do you find 21.92 as well? 21. So write down 21.92 as your marker for your right critical value on your chi-squared distribution. So this is a right chi-squared distribution critical value. That's what it is. It's a right chi-squared distribution critical value. Let's find the left. If you notice this, this is going to give you your rights. This is going to give you your lefts. Do you see how the numbers are different at the top? So this is all those areas to the right. They're small. This one says, okay, the area to the right of this. Now do me a favor. Look at your the table or the, the picture I had you draw, that distribution. The area to the left is 0 0.025, correct? Because we split it. 0 0.025 on the right, that was easy. This gives areas to the right. If the area to the left, think about this, if the area to the left is 0 0.025, what's the area to the right of that marker? Point what? 9.75. Point 9.75. How do you get from point 0 0.025 on the left to point 9.75 on the right? Are you with me today? I don't know. We just used our table right here. And we said that this value was, what was it again? Like that? Yeah. This is a chi-squared right. That's how you write that, chi-squared right. Why is it right? Well, it's, it's on the right. That's why. Now, we're looking for a chi-squared left. 
that table that you just had out, that I just had out, only gives you areas to the right. So if I look at point zero two five, guess what? It's going to give me that again. That would give me the same marker twice and say there's no distance between them when clearly we have a distance between them. True? So you need to be able to identify the area to the right of this. There's one under the whole thing. If point zero two five is here, that means there is one minus point zero two five which is point nine seven five. You see where that's coming from? Where's point nine seven five fall on your, your chart? What's it say? Look that up for me. Look up your degrees of freedom for eleven. Look up your point nine seven five and tell me what it is. Three point eight one six. Did everyone find three point eight one six? Do you feel okay on finding these two markers? So you have two different markers, a chi squared right and a chi squared left. We got three point eight one six, we got twenty one point nine two. Here's how you use those things. How you find confidence intervals. What is our symbol that we're trying to estimate? Are we trying to are we trying to estimate a mu? Are we trying to estimate a p? What are we trying to estimate? Hmm? Say it again. What are we trying to estimate? Are we trying to estimate a mean? What are we trying to estimate? Population variance. What's the symbol for population variance? That's what we're trying to estimate. We're not a P, we're not a portion, we're not a mean, we're not talking about mean, we're talking about variance now. Here's how you find your confidence intervals. It, it's two formulas, one for each side. Remember how we sandwiched our population parameters between a couple bounds? That's still going to happen. Here's what you do. You take your n minus 1 times s squared and your n minus 1 times s squared. Now I want you to see this. These, so far, look a whole lot like, like that, doesn't it? The problem is, do we have that? We don't. We don't have that. Why? Because you don't know the population variance. If you did, you wouldn't be doing this. Because you, you know it, right? We're estimating it here now. We're saying we're going to be 95 or 99 or 90% certain it's falling within this range of numbers. You with me on that? So we don't know it. However, the chi-squared, the chi-squared gives us an estimate. Do the math on this for me for a second. If you solved for that, you would just interchange those things. You with me? And that's what we're going to do. Because that's going to give us an estimate for our variance. It gives us an estimate. A lower estimate? Actually, it's based on that one. An upper estimate, based on this one. Why am I pointing to the wrong ones, you're thinking? Well, that's a bigger number, right? If I divide by a bigger number, it makes things smaller. If I divide by a smaller number, it's bigger. So that's going to give us my two ranges. So interchange those two things, you get an estimate for the population variance. So right here, it's chi-squared right. And here, it's chi-squared left. Why does right go here and left go here? Tell me, tell me why left goes on this side and right goes on this side. Yeah, I want the bigger number at the right bound, right? If I divided by the smaller number here, that'd be too big. So if I divided by the left one here, this one would be bigger than this one. That's not a good thing. We want them in the correct order. So the right goes here because that'll be bigger. The left goes here because that'll be smaller, making this fraction smaller and this fraction larger. So again, where does this come from? It comes from this, basically. It's giving an esti a lower estimate and an upper estimate for the population standard deviation, respectively. That's why we can bind it between those two numbers there. Raise your hand if you're okay with that formula. Good. Would you like to do one example and see how this thing goes? All right. Oh, by the way, if you want to do standard deviation, if you don't want variance and you want standard deviation, what do you have to do to find standard deviation from your variance? Take a square root of everything. And so this is for variance. And then for standard deviation, well, it'd be sigma. Then you have the square root of all that stuff.
you're going to sample 10 appliances. And you're going to read the volts on those things. You see the, the volt outputs should be pretty, we want these 10 appliances to have the same volt outputs. So say like, a, I don't know, your, your hair dryer. This is something, something better than a hair dryer. Maybe your, your micro, yeah, your phone charger. See so your phone charger. You want every phone charger to put out exactly the same amount of voltage, don't you? I would hope so, because otherwise you go, hey, can I borrow your phone charger? Boom! And your battery explodes. You go, what the hell? That sucks. You just ruined my phone. That worked for my phone. Forget your phone. Right now, we, we want our phone charger for the same phones to have the same voltage output, don't we? We don't want them to vary very much, because if they vary too much, we're going to just end up ruining things. And same thing with every other appliance. You want them to put up the same number of volts and not have too much spread. So even if the average comes out the same, could you still have the same spread of data? Or, uh, sorry, different spread of data. Do you remember the bank lines at the opening of this class in Chapter 3? We had 333. Three. We had like, uh, oh, no, no, it was 777. The 777 was like 1, 3, and I don't know, 17 or whatever it was, 14. And they had each had a mean of, of the same thing, but the spread was completely different. So means aren't the only things that are important. Proportions are not the only thing that are important. Spread of your data is also pretty important. We want to make sure the spread of the data is not too much. We want a confidence interval to say, hey, the actual spread of our voltage here is within this range. So we're going to be OK. Or, hey, we need to rethink this because this is too much for us. You got it? So that's the idea behind doing a confidence interval and hypothesis testing with standard deviation and variance. So we have a sample of 10 appliances. And it had a standard deviation, a standard deviation of 0.15 volts. We want to construct a 95% confidence interval for sigma and sigma squared, the variance and the standard deviation. We'll do sigma squared first because sigma is how you, you, you need that from sigma squared anyway, so we may as well just do that first. Now there's a few things we need to know in order to do this. The first thing we need to know is, what is your S? What is your standard deviation? It has to be given to you. What is it? We also need to know our N. What's our N up here? Good. From our end, we should be able to find our degrees of freedom. What's our degrees of freedom here? Nine. Great, subtract one. After that, you need to find two things. So notice we, we have our S. Look up at the board here real quick. We're going to be squaring that S. You follow? You can't forget to square it. If I, if I give you standard deviation, this means variance. You need to square that to get it. We have N, that's great. What's our, what's our sigma? What's our sigma? If we knew that, would we be doing this problem? No. We wouldn't care. We're trying to estimate, based on the sample, the population of our voltage. That's why we're even doing this. We also need to find the markers, chi-squared right and chi-squared left, for a sample size of 10. So that's going to be changing from our last example where we had a sample size of 12. So every time you do this, you're, you potentially could get a different chi-squared right and chi-squared left. So right now we want to find our chi-squared right, our chi-squared left. Based on our picture, how much area is right here? How are we getting 0 If our alpha is 0 0.05, we're splitting that because it's a confidence interval. Confidence intervals have two tails. 0 0.025 here, that's alpha over 2. 0 0.025 here, that's alpha over 2. It looks very similar to that. But right now on your table, I want you to look up, find me my chi-squared right and my chi-squared left.
So we're looking at our table, degrees of freedom is 9, so we should be on that row. We're using the same columns that we just did, though, because we have that same exact picture. So you're going to be looking at 0 0.025 on the row of 9 degrees of freedom, and then you're going to be looking at 0 0.975 on the rows of 9 degrees of freedom. And you get two different numbers. What's, uh, what's this chi-squared right one? 19.02. 19. <laughs> Good, and this left one? 2.77. That's it? 2.700? Zero zero. Sweet. What do we do now? Did you have all this stuff? Just make sure you plug it in right. This is the right one, that's the left one. If you ever get a confidence interval that's backwards, you're like, wait, the bigger number's on the left. You did something wrong. You can go back and fix that. So up here we're going to have our n minus 1. That basically is just your degrees of freedom again, right? n minus 1 is degrees of freedom. So essentially you're plugging in your degrees of freedom here. So we'll have our 9, remember that's degrees of freedom, or n minus 1 times s squared. What is our s again? 0. 0.15. 0. 0.15, okay, 0. 0.15. And what are we going to do to that 0. 0.15, folks? Do not forget to square that. Over, what's our chi-squared? Right. Now that's going to be our lower marker, our lower estimate. And over here we're going to have our upper estimate. It's looking the same on the numerator. 0.15 squared, you got that. But here we're going to put our chi-squared left, that's 2.7. How you do this on your calculator without rounding whatsoever, you do this one in your head, that's just your degrees of freedom, you should already have it on your paper. You take your 0.15, you square it, press enter. Multiply by 9, in this case, press enter, and then divide by 19.023, press enter. So 0.15 squared, enter. Times 9, enter, divide by 19.023, enter, that'll give you your left marker. Do the same process for your right marker. Can someone out there give me my left marker, please? Zero, one, zero, six. So like little robots, that was crazy. <laughs> point zero, one, zero, 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 six. So point zero, one, one. Our voltage was given a standard deviation of uh, point one, five. You can use that, that rounding rule there if you'd like. Point zero, one, one. Go to one more decimal place. Point zero one zero six, right? Yeah. Okay. And then this upper one, you're doing the same exact thing, only you're dividing by two point seven. What's the upper range? What is that? Seven fifty. Seven fifty. It's zero seven five. Okay, you, why are you lying to me? <laughs> How much is it? Point zero seven five. Point zero seven five. Were you able to find those numbers? You sure? You okay with that? Now that's your variance. It says the variance is ranging from 0 0.011 to 0 0.075. However, this is not in volts yet. In order to get something that we really like to deal with, we like to have this in standard deviation. That way the units are the same. And so how do you get from your variance to your standard deviation? So you need to take a square root of those numbers, preferably without rounding it. So if you round them, if you take a square root of that, and you, it's going to be different than a square root of point zero one zero six, which was on your calculator. Are you with me? So when you're going through this, find this number originally, then take a square root and get the next one. Find this number, then take a square root and get the next one. That way you do both of them at the same time. Do you want to round to their decimal place also? Yeah. Okay. It, might, it may work out to the same thing, but there's certain cases where it wouldn't. Can you tell me what you get for your standard deviation? Point zero three. And on the right bound, what, what's that one? Point that? No. no. Which one did you do? Did you do this or did you do the point? Yeah. You did this one? That's what I'm saying. If you, if you don't... If you try to do a square root of this number right here, it is going to be off. What you have to do, listen carefully, you have to do this one, do not alter it, then take a square root of it. 
that will give you the correct thing here. If you don't, if you write it down, they go, oh, I need to find the square root and plug it in again. What have you done? You've just rounded twice, right? That's going to affect it, especially, look at these numbers. I mean, they're to the thousandths. It's going to be off. So make sure you don't do that. Make sure that we're not rounding and then doing the work. Make sure you get them direct from here and direct from here. Is this the correct one getting directly from here? Yes. Okay. Now, this is a little bit more reasonable. Look what it says. It says that our standard deviation was 0.15 volts. Listen carefully to the interpretation here. 0.15 volts. Um, in general, for all of our appliances, we are 95% sure that the, the range in voltage will be either 0 0.103 to 0 0.274. That's the most it could range. We're 95% sure that's, that's how much it will range from appliance to appliance. Are you with me on, on what this interpretation is? That's kind of an important thing to know. If, if we were like, well, we can have it less than 0.5 volts, that'll be fine. Then we're okay. But it's like, well, we can't have it range any more than 0.2. We might be in trouble. Now, how we know we're going to be in trouble is by doing the hypothesis test, which is what we're going to talk about right now. How many would feel okay with the table at least? Good, all right. Same idea for confidence intervals, right? For, with this, it's kind of nice. And once you do that calculation, you're done. You don't have to do any other work.